Hello, everybody. So as the name of the presentation indicates, today we are going to discuss about how networking affects uh, the security solutions for cloud and what implications do you see in there. As the topic uh, deserves, probably is going to generate more questions than potential answers. And uh, the session is a relatively short, short session, so if there is any question, we can, we can go and do some questions and answers. Uh, I'm Peramon Clus, currently at Plant Grid. Uh, it's a SDN company that we started a couple of years ago, or close to a couple of years ago, focused on solutions for data centers and clouds, especially on the notion of multi-tenancy, network virtualization, and some more things that, that we are developing. So let's start on the presentation. And essentially, the, the question at topic is always the, the same, in the sense that Networking has kind of a fundamental role in terms of how to provide secure solutions. But at the same time, uh, originally the intent of networking was to provide connectivity. And there's a natural tension between these two ways of seeing the world. One is I have to connect everything that touches to me. And essentially it's a set of policies that by definition they are open. And the other one, the, the security approach is I want to prevent unwanted connectivity. And the only way to operate in this environment is when you start with a set of default close policies that somehow you have to start opening holes as you define those. And essentially it's a matter of seeing the wall and that's how networking developed in different uh, like the security guys and networking guys because one has to make applications work and then somehow somebody on top starts thinking security. And this is the way you view the wall and how this tension gets solved. And this is not only for security in the sense that if you think that Distributing policies uh, from a security point of view is a notion of where do I apply them, where do I put them. And if you map it to quality of service in the sense that security is uh, deny quality of service versus connectivity is allow quality of service. And there's a lot of grace in between. And you'll see that uh, a lot of the common problems that you see in security in terms of where do you apply policies, and we'll touch a bit on that, uh, apply to in terms of how do you find policies for QoS. And we can, we can discuss this a bit more at the end of the, the presentation. So why is networking and, and security in general so hard? And, and there's multiple reasons. I mean, the first thing is when you start thinking about complex diagrams, usually people build a network, build the connectivity, build the applications, and then you start thinking, where do I secure the network? How do I apply the security policies? And there's a component of where in the sense that when you connect two routers together and they start exchanging information, the idea is that you want them to advertise as much as possible the reachability concepts in a way that everybody can connect. So it's very easy to create a policy where everybody starts propagating information and, and everybody connects to you. But when you start thinking security, it's not about creating a set of policies and you blindly apply them in the network. You have to decide where do you apply them because somehow this mapping between the policy and the physical incarnation of the network, the place where you enforce the policy, it's very relevant in terms of how the application behaves. And the same policies that you will apply in an internet link would for may not make sense if attached to a virtual machine or in front of a database. And, and this is the kind of tensions that make uh, networking and security very different, difficult. So this points to another problem that is that the problem in the sense that is networking security uh, kind of condensed to the notion of defining a policy and applying the policy in the right place? Or is it something else? And the idea is that there's multiple approaches on how to define security. If you think the first one that somehow we could call designing network security is the notion that somehow I develop an application, I have, let's say, a three-tier application with a web layer, application layer, and a database. Uh, my application is running, I have an e-commerce site, and suddenly I have to think what kind of security elements do I need? Do I need to put a firewall? Do I need to put an intrusion prevention? Do I need security policies? And this is kind of an afterthought. I think that I can secure something that somebody else has built already. And usually this is how a lot of times we do security. I mean, we understand that there's a set of best practices and maybe we just open HTTP, HTTPS, SSH, but Somehow we don't think in terms of how security is my design, but rather what kind of policies do I have to apply to kind of have some sense of security. The other is slightly different, is from the beginning when I create my application, 
what kind of addressing scheme, what kind of physical separation, what kind of network elements, what kind of architecture I'm going to create in a way that security gets built from the beginning. And usually this is much harder because it takes time, it takes a lot of agreement between different parties, and, uh, and, and hopefully leads to better results. But essentially it points to this thing that, that network security, I mean, you have to treat it as a system. I mean, it's not something that you can just put an entity that is going to solve the problem for you. And the reason is, is an interesting one, and this is why it's hard again. So because at the end of the day, the problem that you want to solve with network security most likely doesn't start at the network. I mean, when you have an application that you want to deliver, at the end of the day, you are trying to solve a business need. Let's assume that you have some sort of like a shopping basket that you want to sell goods over the internet. That's the business need. You want to have something that customers can reach you and can interact with a system that is providing a service to them. And the business is, is that you have to be able to do that. Now, the problem is that there are some risks on running this type of architecture because now you have financial information from your customers, you may be exposed to different kind of attacks, and you run some sort of risk analysis that is going to feed back to the business needs and maybe you have to refine your business needs. As soon as you've done the risk analysis, then you have to start defining security policies. And the security policies are not necessarily only networking security policies. They may like placement things. Can people enter in the building that you run your database systems? Can uh, virtual machines belonging to another tenant be co-resident in the same server as you are? I mean, the set of policies that you may de derive from the business needs and from the risk analysis that you've done, they may go beyond of what you can solve with a specific instance of a firewall or bounce or a VPN device. And then the last step is when you have defined those business policies, you translate them into your security system where the network is a part of it. But often, because somehow the definition of machines, applications, and things like that get expressed through IP addresses, people think that the network will solve those problems. And this is what we are seeing with all the proliferation that every time that you see a network problem, a network security problem, then some appliance, some service will come to solve the problem. That leads to a lot of complexity because somehow you kind of both security in one step at a time. And it's a race to completion in the sense that Another attack comes and you go from firewalls to application firewalls. Uh, you want some sort of encryption mechanism. And it becomes very incremental and over time the cost to manage that solution is unbearable because the level of expertise that you need and the life cycle of the policies that you embed in those machines becomes uh, difficult to understand. I mean, when a firewall has been there with 2,000 policies or 10,000 policies for four years, do you know which ones are relevant, which ones are not, and you are not uh, capable of touching it anymore because the people that deploy them to start with, maybe they are gone. So, so that's kind of where we are today in the security. But what happens when we think in terms of cloud? Uh, cloud is an interesting thing because a cloud provider by itself has a set of business needs that needs to fulfill, which basically is to resell some sort of compute and infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. And from those business needs, it's going to basically do its own risk analysis, define its own security policies, create a security system. But now the trick is that this has to be exposed to the consumers of cloud, to the tenants of cloud. And they may have a different set of business requirements. So somehow now what happens is that you compound a security system on top of another security system, where on the top you have many players that may have different needs. And this is an interesting problem because what happens when a tenant has a business need that is, I cannot be co-placed with a competitor? How do you define a competitor? How do you define transit policies? How do you define data leakage? And these are the kind of things that so far we've not seen a lot of SLAs in terms of security provided by cloud providers. But if this model of compounding one on top of the other as enterprises start onboarding into the cloud, is going to become more and more relevant to understand what capabilities do we need from the cloud providers and from OpenStack in general in order to augment the capabilities of the network to solve some of those problems. So somehow, um, how do you break the problem in smaller pieces? I mean, like this is kind of untreatable, but the way uh, that could be start to manage was what if I start thinking what are the requirements in terms of me as a cloud provider versus me as a tenant? And the first obvious one is uh, isolation. I mean, how, as a cloud provider, do I create an environment that I create hard isolation uh, frameworks between my tenants 
between the internet and my tenants, and especially between the control structures of cloud. Because somehow, if somebody takes control or cracks into the control infrastructure, into the cloud management system, all bets are off that all these barriers are going to be relevant. Especially when we start converting the workflows of compute storage and networking into a single structure, that's going to lead into more and more problems from the security point of view. And saying that we require isolation is, is easy. Doing it is much more difficult, especially when we have an environment that we want to have self-provisioning. Self-provisioning implies that me from the cloud, I should be able to somehow reach the cloud management system structures. So what kind of provisioning mechanism do we put in terms of security to prevent some unauthorized access? The other aspect, of course, is that uh, multi-tenancy. All these customers are going to compound on top of the same infrastructure at the compute level, at the storage level, and the networking level. And the fact that cloud providers want to offer many more services that may be shared. So the idea is this, is how to create something that isolates, but at the same time that enables all the kind of requirements that the business needs of the cloud provider uh, require. The second view is the tenant view. From the tenant point of view, uh, now I have provided that the cloud provider guarantees that I'm not going to have traffic from other tenants uh, entering to my network or vice versa. Uh, how do I see security? And maybe the approach is a little bit more traditional in the sense that I see a bunch of applications expressed in the form of virtual machines, storage, networks, interfaces, ports, and now I can bring the concepts that I had into my traditional security books on putting policies based on IP addresses, ports, filtering rules, and so on. And I start bringing the concepts of where do I apply them. But now, the where do I apply them is a little bit more difficult because apart from maybe the interface attachments of the virtual machines, we are dealing with virtual networks. So the notion of where do I apply security policies become relevant because those become virtual links. And how those virtual links are going to be mapped into the physical infrastructure of the cloud provider, it's not only unknown, it's dynamic. Depending on where my virtual machines are going to boot, the policies may have to be expressed in different places. The second aspect is that the policy mechanisms that we've been seeing from IP tables, filtering rules, access control list, a lot of the times they are very specific. I want to prevent that a virtual machine or an IP address that exists into my web layer doesn't talk to my database layer. And I may want to specify uh, prefix-based rules kind of to cover ranges, but when I want to allow connectivity, maybe I want to be very precise. I want to say that specific IP address from VM application server can talk to the database. So now what happens is that that was a model coming from the physical world where ports, machines, servers were provisioning at some point. Uh, they were booted, they have an IP address, and now I could define those policies. When I live in a dynamic world, now there is a disconnect between the definition of the policy and the rendering of the policy. In the sense that I have two virtual machines running, they are supposed to access the database, that's perfectly fine. Maybe the database uh, has some sort of policy here that defines that these two virtual machines can connect to the database. And now suddenly a third VM boots that has a new IP address that was not in the list. So it's not only the policies attached to the new VM that boots that they have to revisit, but even the policies that have somehow been rendered into all the ports that could potentially have an interaction with the new VM may have to be revisited. And this is where we have this transition between the physical world and the logical world or the virtual world, where we have to think very carefully in terms of what do we understand by policies and filtering rules, and how do we make it in a way that they can dynamically be adjusted every time that a new VM boots. So it's not only attaching policies to a VM interface, but rather revisiting all the existing VMs and all the existing interface and see how the new VM affects to the existing policies. The, going back to the notion of isolation, um, what is isolation? I mean, because it's very abstract in a sense that uh, one entity should not be able to talk to the other entity. But is it only like that? I mean, is it, uh, if we think in terms of provider, do I want isolation in terms of physical placement? Do I want to be co-placed with somebody that potentially has a hostile relation with me? Do I want to be in the same hypervisor in the same rack? Do I have critical applications that may be deserving its own physical infrastructure? Do I want transit policies? Uh, my traffic, should it be uh, capable of going through an internet link uh, when I'm having all my virtual machines inside? 
Should I have some sort of detailed characteristics? So these are the kind of things that as we start defining what SLAs cloud providers will offer, different types of enterprises or different types of users of cloud will be able to understand if onboarding their workloads into cloud is worth it the risk. And this is the kind of things that today, the, the models that we are expressing in terms of policy, they are more IP address based, but we have to start thinking that when the environment goes from a physical uh, data center into a virtual data center, what kind of new definitions and new policies do we have to create to give some sense of security or some real security to the tenants that are sitting or our cloud providers? And this is going to be an open field uh, for a while in the sense that more and more uh, definitions of isolation can be created. But we have to find a way that how do we manage it and who does it in the sense that I'm a tenant. How do I request that I don't want to be placed close to somebody that is hostile to me? Do I have an interface? Do I define it as a policy? How do I even know the notion of the risk level that I'm taking being co-placed with somebody else? And even from the policies that, that the tenant may own, what kind of interfaces and where do you attach them on the placement that we were discussing before? This is going to be compounded by the fact that what are the enforcement points? Are they common between the cloud provider and the tenant? If they are common, how do I merge the policies? Uh, do I need new type of policies? And how do I manage them? And what we were discussing before about definition versus rendering, that a lot of policies may apply to an abstract concept like a web machine, but then sometimes they get rendered into an IP address. How do I make process, this process dynamic that every time that new VMs get on board, that, that the rendering happens to the new and the old uh, policy that existed? And the last problem is the workflows. The, the notion that security and connectivity were traditionally isolated into different uh, entities had a reason to be. The reason was that I can define that I want to put a virtual machine and I want to onboard this virtual machine with a set of uh, network characteristics. But at the same time, I want to define the policies. If the person that defines the policies and the person that puts the machine is the same, somehow security is complicated because if there is some compromise entity that has the control to both, one will not be able to enforce the characteristics that the first was supposed to provide. So the, the current workflows that, that we have in cloud management systems, especially in OpenStack, I think they will have to evolve and before there were nice discussions about trust and how to jumpstart the system, messaging and so on that, that will be very relevant as we move forward into the network. So now that we have discussed a lot about uh, policies and enforcement and things like that, the next is what happens with a life cycle of security? I mean, one thing is to do my analysis, my risk analysis, defining my policies, implementing my security strategy and so on. But now I'm sitting on top of a cloud provider that provides the enforcing mechanism for me. And what happens uh, in terms of monitoring, in terms of forensics, in terms of compliance checks? Now I'm sitting on top, I don't see all these things. I don't even have a, a preview of what's going on because imagine that I'm under an attack, my security policies may be inappropriate, but I don't even see it, I don't even know it because the cloud provider is seeing all these logs or is managing all these logs. How do I know that maybe I should start boosting my security because I'm starting to see certain attacks coming to my network? So the, the notion of who owns the reporting, the monitoring, the logging, how do I access to my logs? Do the logs that me as a tenant I get because uh, somebody's trying to attack me belong to me or belong to the cloud provider? How do I create the workflows that I can have this mechanism that I can preview what's going on under the infrastructure of the cloud provider in relation to me? And, and these are a lot of things that today they are not defined. And the only way is going to be with adding a lot of visibility, not only visibility in terms of traffic analytics, traffic monitoring, and understanding of the workflows in the network, but rather accessing to the security logs, accessing to the, all the attacks. And how do I generate this information with a proper tagging mechanism that me as a tenant, I can only consume the ones that relate to me? And how do I extract that? So if now after this introduction we we jump a bit more into OpenStack. Uh, I was trying to look um, where we are and, and what's going on at OpenStack and, and what kind of directions are taken and where uh, some improvements could be taken. So from the current model, uh, there's the Cloud Controller node, and of course, uh, and this presentation is a bit networking-centric. There's much more than, than just the network that 
you'd have the compute, the networking, and the storage somehow provisioned by the cloud management system. And somehow through plugins on the quantum server, there's going to be a way to reach the network infrastructure, what in this slide taken from, from the quantum admin guide would be called the data network. And hopefully this goes through a secure management network that it's an out-of-band channel, and let's assume that that part is secure somehow. But somehow the network controller is going to define through the plugin agents the characteristics that you need from the network every time that you would. <coughs> but the network, it's becoming a bit more complicated because somehow there's two components to the network. Originally the network was physical networks. You would have physical switches, routers, firewalls, you name it. And you'd have ways to onboard tenants, like with a flat network, with IP tables, you would have VLANs, you would have mechanisms to change the network infrastructure that would allow you to create the notion of isolation at the network level. But now on top of that, we compound the notion of virtual networks. And virtual networks could be at the overlay level, could be different types of ones. And the mapping between these two is going to be interesting because somehow a way to attack or a way to, to be inserted in the middle would be the notion of how can I connect to a network that belongs to a tenant that is not me. And as we have this duality of physical and logical, now there's going to be more opportunities for me to find an open port or an open virtual port. And based on that, be able to inject my traffic or receive my traffic from a specific tenant that I'm targeting. If we look on top of that, what kind of network capabilities OpenStack is offering, there's kind of two major distinctions. Uh, the first one would be the notion of virtual networks, and ideally is where virtual ports attach or virtual machine ports attach. And then there's the notion of physical networks where physical servers exist. But in reality, it's not that straightforward because then on top, depending on the plugins you have, some plugins may be able to control local networks. In this case, they live exactly in the virtual world or you would be able to manipulate the switches like attaching to VLANs. But in between you have these entities like Linux breaches that they have ports in the virtual world and ports in the physical world. You have like the overlay networks that they have the same. They have ports in the virtual world and they connect to physical entities that through encapsulation are going to carry the entity of the virtual network where they are connecting. And not only that, that the notion of tenant and provider networks compound on top of that. You could have tenant networks that map directly to the physical infrastructure and tenant networks that map to the logical infrastructure. And all this through plugins that not necessarily manage the whole network as a coherent entity. So the idea is that if now we have plugins that manage the overlay, who manages the fabric? And if we don't manage the fabric, what happens if somebody manipulating the fabric can connect to the overlay that some tenant owns and creating essentially money in the middle attack and being able to see the traffic that belongs to that tenant? What if it's the opposite? What if the plugin now controls the physical fabric? And because of that, now every time that you have a tenant that appears, you change the physical fabric and you have some misconfigurations, and same, you have some open ports that you can connect physically to it. So because of this split of network virtualization in terms of virtual and physical, now we have created a bunch of new problems or new definitions, and this is not by any means exhaustive, that somehow you have to see how you can compromise a network. How can I onboard a physical server into the system? How can I onboard a virtual machine into the system that not necessarily are the ones that, that the tenant thinks they are? And how do I prevent this, the notion of rock ports or tabs attaching to networks that are not authorized? And this would be the notion of kind of spoofing, but at the next level. How can I, in a cloud provider, start spoofing the identity of a tenant in a way that my virtual machines or my physical machines will be compromised? And the other aspect would be what happens if this is not possible because we have the proper certificates, we have the proper configuration models, and no, you cannot do that. But the question is always what if it happens because a hypervisor gets compromised, because a cloud management system gets compromised, and what kind of remediation mechanisms are we going to put in order to solve that? So the, the next would be from the tenant point of view, and this is what we were discussing before already, that uh, at the virtual environment, uh, we would go probably in more traditional ways, like how do I define the policies, how do I render, how do I enforce them, but how do I insert services into the mix? And services could be in many ways, could be like traditional physical appliances, could be virtual appliances, or could be distributed security devices. But at the end of the day, it's kind of mapping the physical world that we understand today into this logical world, but understanding what implications do we have on that. 
So if we look at these two cases, there's something common about, about them. That somehow, when we went from physical deployments to virtual deployments, there was a split in terms of identity and location. And this identity and location split, you can see the different levels. The first one would be when the identity of a virtual machine and the address of the virtual machine may not mean the same. Because they may want to express security policies based on identities. This is a web server versus an application server. And I know them because I have the UUID and I can correlate through the cloud management system the function that they perform. Versus the address that they may get that belongs more to about what subnet do they connect. And what happens when I move a VM from one uh, virtual network to another virtual network? Or what happens when I move a VM from one data center to the next data center? And the location may change, but the identity stays the same. How do I start thinking and decoupling the policies of identity and location or virtual or IP address uh, in a different way? Which somehow goes back to the same model at the network level. We transform from physical networks to virtual networks. How do I start understanding the mapping of those virtual networks on top of physical networks? And how do I make sure that when a virtual network appears on a physical network that was not supposed to appear, how do I prevent that? So this split that we have to create uh, between the virtual and the physical world means that now the policies that we have to create, they have to expand and be able to accommodate that. And if you think, compared to what happened when, when we had security features like port security into the switching world where we would associate a physical port with a MAC address with an IP address, that was a binding of the physical reality with the identity, with the IP address, with the location. And now we have to transform this into the cloud world. What happens when the notion of port is a virtual port? If I attach a port security rule with a virtual port, it doesn't mean anything because I could move the virtual machine into another place and still fulfill the policy. Or I could spoof a virtual machine identity and appear with the same port ID somewhere else and still meet the policy. So we have to start thinking how do we use some anchor into the physical reality as an entity that we can use to enhance the policies to give some sense of, of solving the problem of this uh, identity location separation. And as I was discussing before, um, the thing gets compounded with the fact that I have multi-sites. All these identity and policies that get expressed within a cloud management system within a data center, what's going to happen when I have multiple of them? What's going to happen when I have virtual networks that expand across sites and I can have mobility events or I can have uh, active disaster recovery sites? And the actions that happen in one of the data centers have to be reflected into the other data center. And this is the kind of things that, uh, as we start thinking in terms of federation systems and security, the notion of expressing the location and the identity of the machines that we are booting and the network uh, that they belong, they'll have to be carried across that. So there's been a lot of things that have already been said in terms of security and the things that can be done at OpenStack. But uh, as, as Folsom and some of the work for Grizzly is going already, I mean, you have the notion of how do I move from the security policies that we have today to more advanced security. One way is to go the service or the advanced service direction. How do I onboard firewalls? How do I onboard physical firewalls or virtual firewalls? How do I onboard uh, different kind of security devices? And that we could generalize it with the notion of how do we connect physical appliances at the provider level or at the tenant level? And how do we abstract it in a way that the workflow uh, is nice and easy and simple to understand from the tenant or from the provider point of view. The next would be this, from physical, how do I move to virtual appliances? How do I instantiate virtual appliances that are going to provide these choke points for, let's say, my tenants? And what kind of configuration models do I have to hook to them? And then the next problem appears in terms of how do I place them? Do I place them in my server, in my rack? Do I aggregate some virtual machines against a virtual appliance that sits somewhere else? So there's the notion of distribution and, and placement, which goes to the next level is, what about having distributed appliances? How can I have, in the same way as I have a distributed virtual switch or a distributed virtual router, how can I get a distributed virtual firewall, a distributed load balance, or a distributed intrusion prevention? And this would be kind of the next step for moving from physical world to virtual appliances to fully distributed network security devices. Then the next direction would be based on what we were discussing, the notion of new policy capabilities. What kind of definitions do I have to put in my policies in a way that I start accommodating this notion that maybe I don't want to do policies based on IP addresses, 
maybe I want to do it based on identities, and the rendering of the policy is going to be the one that does the matching and the enforcement point definition. The next is these bindings between physical and virtual. Uh, how do I express them? And me as a tenant, I cannot express them because I don't even know on top of what infrastructure I'm running. Essentially, the cloud provider has to provide me some SLS that when I boot a virtual machine, the, re the physical incarnation of this virtual machine is known to the cloud provider. So if now some other virtual machine claims to be me in a different location, those kind of bindings will only be able to be provided by the cloud provider. And this is the kind of things that we have to start defining what SLAs the cloud provider through the cloud management system can offer to the end user and how to express the security SLAs. The rest would be the notion of what certifications and workflow, workflows can we have in the cloud management systems and how do we articulate them in a way that goes and works not only in a data center, across data centers and so on. So this is not, not a complete list. I mean, there's many other things that we could discuss and explore, but somehow is this notion that from the security point of view, we have to think not only at the tenant level and at the policy definition level, but even the virtualization aspect, what elements and what opportunities does it bring in order to create complex policies. And as a conclusion, before we come into questions and answers, essentially is that there's no easy answer for security. I mean, there's always uh, a lot of problems in terms of designing the proper systems, but essentially that this virtual and physical separation that somehow at the beginning maybe looked as, as messy and difficult to digest in terms of how to map it to policy, in reality gives a lot of opportunity because if we think that we lost this notion of separation between who enforces the policy and who deploys a virtual machine and the policies itself, the bringing back the security in terms of where have things been placed, it's an opportunity that allows you to have something ephemeral that, that gives you an attachment to where the things are running at that time. Again, the centralized control structures uh, are more vulnerable, so we need the proper workflows there, and definitely they are simpler to, to manage and deploy. And, and the conclusion that we were discussing at the beginning that uh, if we think security from the beginning rather than when the system already has all the connectivity in place, it's over long term going to lead to better and more secure systems. So after this very high level introduction, uh, if there's any question. And maybe I think you could use the microphone. You raised a question about linking the physical network architecture simply onto the virtual world. Mm -hmm. I, did, I do agree with that uh, it would not be appropriate. There would be more different uh, uh, virtual network architecture. So do you have any idea or clue to that more appropriate virtual network architecture? So that's a very philosophical question in the sense that there's reasons why you may want to have fabric controllers that would change the network configuration every time. So going back to the physical reality, how to hook a tenant network into a physical substrate. And you see some of the technologies, OpenFlow based, uh, BGP based, some of them going into that direction. Uh, that's the other angle of going overlays. And overlays could be, you name it, Theory, Lisp, MBGRE, STP, VXLAN. So there's many, many forms of that. Philosophically, what you have is that in reality, you want to contain the entropy of, of every time that the tenant gets created because if at the end what you strive is for operational simplicity, you want to make sure that every time that you provision a new tenant, you provision a new network, that minimizes the notion of disruptions into your network. Uh, that has pros and cons of one model versus the other. If you go the fabric controller model, what happens is that every time that you onboard a new tenant, you're going to have churn over the network. Your core, your fabric is going to be reconfigured and this based on open flow or routing protocols, you name it. I mean, that's a technology detail. So what's going to happen is if you think in terms of the, the costs of running an infrastructure as a twofold, one is the cost of the physical infrastructure, how much do you pay for a specific suite, router, whatever. The other is the operational aspect, how much do you pay to manage a system. If you think that every time that a tenant is going to be onboarded, you change the configuration of your fabric, what's going to happen that this at some point is going to lead to misconfigurations, failures, uh, problems that you will have to troubleshoot. So you'll have to have expertise in terms of how to troubleshoot 
a multi-tenant network with a fabric. And that is going to add cost, cost and, and stability probably. Now you go to the other extreme where you put the overlay. You put an overlay, the fabric is very stable, very rock solid. You don't change it. You have physical attachments where they have IP addresses that don't move. And now you push all this noise, all this entropy to the edge, to the overlay. Uh, now what happens is that uh, you save the fabric because you don't touch it every time you create a new tenant. But what's going to happen is that at the fabric you will not see, or, or basically the overlay will not see what's going on at the fabric. So you may not create as an efficient structure as you would have if you would control the fabric. So I don't think there's right or wrong. There's depending on what your pain. If your pain is operational models, maybe the overlay works better. If you are more obsessed about traffic engineering and QoS and planning the network and the topology, maybe changing the configuration of the fabric may be a better solution. So depending on what's your criteria in terms of as a cloud provider, what do you want to offer to your tenants uh, as a service? Yes, so that's, uh, I mean, if you ask me, OpenStack is still fluid. The kind of networking capabilities that it's going to offer are still changing and evolving. Uh, you have to think a different way. The best practices is something that exists because they have been developed over the years. So networking, for good or bad, has a lot of best or practices that you would say. You would never put a database and a web server in the same subnet, regardless if you have policies or not. Doesn't make any sense. I mean, that would be kind of a best practice. In a way that when you start uh, using these cloud structures and you say, well, I'm going to give you a distributed virtual switch, what else do you need? And it's not so easy because you know how to do your applications, you know your risk, you have done your risk analysis over the last 10 years. And the notion that is missing is how do you carry all this expertise into this world? So rather than, and there's different views on that too. I mean, some people will say, this is a new world, you have to learn and develop new set of best practices. The other is, well, can you provide abstractions that look and feel similar to the ones that you have in enterprises? And now you carry the best practices with you. So I think the, the discussion is not done. Different SDN companies will have different approaches to it. Uh, I'm part of a software defined network company that we have our own views in terms of how the management models and how the securities and how the things should be. But essentially, uh, breaking with the past may not be completely the most uh, uh, wise thing to do, especially when you start thinking that the new cloud providers that are appearing right now, they may want to onboard enterprises. And those enterprises may have best practices. So the question is, what, what kind of environment in terms of network and security do you give on top of a cloud environment that at least makes existing enterprises feel comfortable with, going back to your point of best practices? And I think this is still on the works. There's, there's a lot of ways to solve the problem. And, and we are going to see it in the next months, years, different answers to your question. Any other question? Perfect. Thank you.